If you have your Bible, turn to Psalm 100, if you would. And if you don't have your Bible, then it'll be on the screen. And uh, I suppose we live in such an era, uh, you may just pull out an electronic device and your Bible may be on there now, so you don't really turn to anything. So however you have your Bible this morning, you would take it out and turn to Psalm 100. And if you have your sermon notes handy, you may want to go ahead and grab those as well. Many Bible scholars tell us that Psalm 100 is one of the most beautiful psalms in the entire Bible. It is an interesting psalm because it is connected to 2 Chronicles chapter 35. Now that's not in your notes or on the screen, but you may want to write that down in there somewhere or in your Bible. 2 Chronicles chapter 35 and Psalm 100 uh, go hand in hand in some fashion. In 2 Chronicles chapter 34, King Josiah was having the temple cleaned out. He was having all the false idols taken out of God's temple and disposed of. He was trying to get the people back to true worship of God, of Yahweh. And in the temple somewhere buried under something, they found the book of the law. They found the word of God that God had given to Moses. They came running to the king and said, we have found the book of the law. And they began to read the book of the law. They began to read the word of God, we would say. And they began to discover things that they should have been doing that they had not been doing up until that time. They had blended their worship and blended their, their idols with God. And everything was just a mess in the temple. And so he was cleaning out the temple and getting things right for true worship of God, and he was getting ready to reinstate the Passover. The Israelites would celebrate the death angel passing over them. And so that is all happening in 2 Chronicles 34 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 35. And so it's very important because at that time period, Psalm 100, along with Psalm 33, which is a psalm of praise, and Psalm 66 and 67, which are both psalms of thanksgiving, those psalms are all written along that same time period that King Josiah was cleaning out the temple and getting ready to reinstate worship to the one true God. So you can write down 2 Chronicles 34 and 35 if you wanted to, and then Psalm 33, 66, 67, and 100. All four of these psalms go together. So Psalm 33 is a psalm of praise, as we said. Psalm 66 and 67 are psalms of thanksgiving. And Psalm 100 is a psalm of thanksgiving, but it is also a hymn that the people would sing as they were uh, making their procession, making their way to the temple to worship God. So this was really a song that they would sing on their way uh, to the temple to worship God. And here's what the psalmist writes. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Do you know who you belong to this morning? We are his if we're believers. We are his. And then he says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And why do we do all of this? Because the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Do all these things because the Lord is good and his love endures for all generations. With all of my heart this morning, I believe that we live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. I believe that we as Americans have been blessed and highly favored by God. And it is fitting for us in this nation, especially Christians, to give thanks to God and to praise his name. As Ruth was receiving the offering today, she talked about Christmas and how children compile lists and grandchildren compile lists of things they would like to have for Christmas. And it is not unusual for us to make those kinds of lists at Christmas time. 
When your children are young, they ask for all kinds of things that they would like to have for Christmas. And as they get older, they may tell you one or two things they'd like to have, and and you may think you know what they would like to have. And so even as they get older, we try to compile a list of things that they may like for Christmas. Now, it's not like it was in my day, and I'm not as old as some folks, but when I was a child, they sent these great big catalogs in the mail. You always got a J.C. Penney catalog every year. Anybody old enough to remember that? And, and I would just salivate almost at that J.C. Penney catalog, turning the pages and seeing all the things that I would love to have on a Christmas morning under the tree. And that, that catalog was just full of all kinds of things that my imagination couldn't even get my mind around sometimes. Well, things have changed a little bit nowadays, and my wife will tell our kids, even though they're older now, ask them, what do you want for Christmas? And then she'll usually follow up with this statement, just sign into Amazon and put it in the cart, and then I'll go in and pay for it and buy it for you that way. So now we just fill our carts up on Amazon with what our kids and our grandkids want, and we just purchase it that way. But we do make those kinds of lists at Christmas time. When New Year's rolls around, sometime around uh, December 30th, 31st, we'll begin thinking about things we would like to implement into our lives. We call them resolutions, or we call them life changes, and things we want to do different or do better in the coming year. And we'll begin to make a list around New Year's as well of things we want to implement into our lives. But too many times we overlook Thanksgiving, I believe, and Thanksgiving Day as a day that we should make a list of things that we are thankful for in our lives. This past Wednesday night at our family night of thankfulness, we had a great time. About 100 people showed up in the lower level that night, and uh, we fed them uh, a good meal that night, and turkey tacos, very good as a matter of fact, and uh, we watched the Charlie Brown uh, Thanksgiving movie, and we just had a good time eating popcorn and laughing together and having a good time, but as every person came in the lower level, they were uh, directed to a table with a small sheet of paper that simply said, I am thankful for, and they had to write down one thing they were thankful for that night while they were there. And so Debbie Perry put all those words together and made a word cloud for us that we showed that night. So about 100 of you have already seen this, but the rest of you get to see it today for the first time. Here is the word cloud she came up with, with all the things that we were thankful for that night of thankfulness. And you see right in the middle of that is family. But there's some really interesting things on there. One person was thankful for hugs. Somebody was thankful for slinkies. Somebody, I have not, it wasn't me, even put my name. They were thankful for me on this word cloud. And so those are just some of the things that they were thankful for that night. Harvest Ministries is on that word cloud as well. And as you look at that slide and look at that word cloud, the whatever you are thankful for may not be on that slide, but I am convinced that if we would take just a few moments this week to make a list of things we're thankful for, I suspect we would be thankful for more things that are not material than things that are material. And when we really begin to think about the blessings of God in our lives. For me personally, I'm thankful for my health and I'm thankful for my family. I am thankful for my friends and for the nation that we get to live in. But more importantly, I am thankful for my salvation. And I am thankful for my church family. And I am thankful for the mercy that God showers on me each and every day of my life. Because let me tell you, God showers me with mercy every day. And God showers me with grace every day. And I don't deserve it, but he still showers it on me in my life. And so as we think about our history as Americans, there was never a group more underprivileged than a small handful who came over on the Mayflower who began a custom of setting aside a day for thanksgiving to Almighty God. They had no homes, and they had no government agencies to help them build homes. Their only food came from the sea and what they could harvest from the forest around them, and they had to get that food for themselves. They had no real amusements except what they made for themselves, and they had no way to communicate with their family back in England but they had four of the greatest qualities that any human being could ever have. They had initiative. You know what it takes to get on a boat, 
to sail across the sea to a land you've never been to before, but you've only heard of it. It takes initiative to do something like that. They had initiative. They had courage. It took courage to get on the Mayflower and to sail across the sea to come to the new land. They had a willingness to work. They were not lazy. I can almost guarantee you there were no lazy people in that first colony. They were all workers, and they were willing to work. And the fourth thing they had was a faith in God. They had faith in God. It almost sounds strange to me today to say or to have to say that they had faith in God because in our nation there is a powerful force at work trying to strip this nation of every reminder of its foundation that our nation was built upon and the conviction that we say we are still one nation under God. And we still believe that today. We are one nation under God, and yet there are powerful forces trying to strip that away from us. And so our Declaration of Independence proclaims this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. And it ends with these words. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That is what our Declaration of Independence declares. And all throughout it, you see divine providence at work in that declaration. Thanksgiving Day is a very unique holiday. It doesn't commemorate a battle of any sort that took place in our nation. It doesn't celebrate someone's birthday or someone's anniversary. It is simply set aside as a day to express our nation's thanks to God for his blessings on us. Now that is what Thanksgiving was intended to be from its founding. A day that this nation would stop everything it was doing and take some time to thank God for his blessings upon this nation. In fact, in 1789, President George Washington made a public proclamation regarding Thanksgiving. And I'm going to read a portion. It's not on the screen. I just want you to hear the words that he spoke in 1789. And I want you to hear the strong, absolute acknowledgement of the fact that God was involved in our nation from its very founding and how dependent we should be upon him. Here's what President Washington said. By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor, and whereas... Both houses of Congress have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a public day of thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts and many, the many favors of Almighty God. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the author of all that is good, that was, that is, or that will be. Now that is what Thanksgiving was intended to be. A day when the people of this country stopped what they were doing and acknowledged the blessings of God and not just thank him, but also offer prayers of thanksgiving to God for all that he has done in our life. This coming Thursday, our nation will once again pause and celebrate Thanksgiving Day. And one would assume from the example of our forefathers that we would be an extremely thankful people. But sadly, the opposite is often true. The more we get in this life many times, the less thankful we become. Some of you have experienced this in your own life when you have had children or you have seen children at Christmas time 
and they get gift after gift after gift, and they open and open and open and open. And I have seen children look at their parents and say, is this all I get? And it takes everything within you to <laughs> not get out the rod and not spoil the child, right? But have you ever done that in your own life? You receive and receive and receive, and you get and you get, and you think, is this all there is? As we look at the example of our forefathers, we see that many times the more we have, the less thankful we are. The more we receive, many times the less mindful we are of God and God's blessings, and the more that we want in our lives. And it seems as though this may be part of the reason that Psalm 100 was written. Notice to whom the author addresses this psalm. In the first verse, he addresses it to all the earth. And in the last verse, he includes all generations. So this is written to all of the earth and to every generation who ever comes along on the face of the earth. I believe this message of thanksgiving is so deep and so wide that it should apply to every person in every era, in every stage of life. And why is that? Because there is something powerful about us coming together as a group of people giving thanks to God for what he has done in our lives. And when we begin to give thanks to God, it begins to tear down the barriers and tear down the walls that separate us and divide us. And as we give thanks to God, it actually brings us together and begins to unify us. Listen, you can't thank God when there's disunity and there's not harmony. You can't thank God when people are fighting and bickering with each other. But if you begin to thank God and begin to praise God for all his blessings on you and all his blessings on your family and all his blessings on this church, it begins to unify us together and tear down those barriers and tear down those walls. And I believe that's part of the reason that this was written. But there is a real danger, especially in this season of determining our thanksgiving on how much we have. Will I have enough turkey on Thursday to stuff myself sufficiently so that I can barely move? And if not, will I be thankful? You know, that people think about that. And so you keep buying turkeys and you keep buying food and you have a family of three or a family of four, but it's never enough. You've got to have more. You've got to have three pies and you've got to have two cakes and you've got to have three turkeys, all right? We've got to have enough because the more we have and the bigger the spread of the table, the more thankful we are for what we have. Is my money secure in the bank? Am I healthy? And if I'm not healthy, can I thank God even when I'm not healthy? You see, sadly, many times, even we as Christians, you use these kinds of things to determine whether or not we're going to be thankful. But the Word of God reminds us repeatedly that these things may change. There may be a day when you don't have enough food to put on the table. There may be a time when your health is not good. There may be a time when you don't have enough money in the bank. There may be a time when you're not working. There may be a time when you do lose that house or you lose that car. There may be a time when you do go through a separation or through a divorce. There may be a time in your life where your children go off the rails and turn away from God. Will you still be thankful in those times when life is bad? Or am I only going to be thankful when life is good and I have plenty and sometimes even more than I need? You see, those things will drift away sometimes or sometimes they'll be destroyed or sometimes people will steal those things from us. And the only thing that is certain in our life is our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that is certain is your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're basing your happiness and your contentment on anything you own or anything you have, you have invested your happiness and contentment in the wrong thing because it can be taken, it can be stolen, it can go away at any moment. But Jesus Christ will always be there with us. He is that friend that sticks closer than a brother, the Bible says. He's always there and can never be taken away from us. 
And that's exactly what Psalm 100 emphasizes. In verses 1, 2, 3, and 5, the writer puts the name of the Lord there. 1, 2, 3, and 5, we see the Lord, we see his name. And then in verse 4, we are told to enter his gates with thanksgiving. What is the writer telling us? He is telling us that the Lord is the basis. He's the foundation for our thanksgiving. Nothing else. It is not your turkey that's the basis for your thanksgiving. It's not. It's not your pumpkin pie or your sweet potato pie. That's not it. It's not your world-famous dish that everybody wants you to make every year. That's not the basis of your thanksgiving. It is not your job. It's not your 401. It's not your 403. It is none of that. The writer says, the Lord is the basis of my thanksgiving. Everything's built on him. Everything revolves around him. Everything I have must begin with the Lord. This is why I give thanks. And then the psalmist gives us some commands as we go through and think about how to change our attitudes to become attitudes of gratitude. First, he gives us a tremendous command to shout. In verse 1, he says this, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. The word shout that he uses literally means to shout with the force of a trumpet blast. Now, Pastor Austin is not here this morning. I was going to have him blow his trumpet real quick for me, but he's not here. But shout to the Lord with the blast of a trumpet. What does that mean? The Lord has been so good to me, I need to shout sometimes. The Lord has protected me, and I need to shout sometimes. The Lord has provided for me, and sometimes I need to shout about that. God has healed me, and I need to shout about that sometimes. God has provided uh, finances for me, and I need to shout about that sometimes. God helped me pay all the bills this month. I need to shout about that. God brought my family back into the fold. I should shout about that. My God, if he saw the problem for you, you've got something to shout about. If he's ever touched your body, you've got something to shout about. If God's given you the direction to go in, you've got something to shout about this morning. Shout. I know we all came from different church backgrounds, and some of you are Pentecostal, and some of you are charismatic, and some of you are Methodist and Presbyterian and Catholic and whatever you were. But listen, when God does something good, you ought to shout about the goodness of God in your life. If I can, I'll just say it, if I can yell and scream like a crazy man at a football game on a television set, then I can surely shout and scream for what God has done in my life and in my family and in my body and in my finances. I can surely shout about that. Mm. Shout. Shout for joy for what God has done. Then he gives us a command to serve. Look what the psalmist says. Serve the Lord with gladness. So first I'm going to shout because of what he's done. Now I'm going to serve the Lord. How am I going to serve him? With gladness. It doesn't say serve the church. Although if you serve the Lord, you'll want to become a servant of everything else. But it doesn't say first serve the church. It doesn't first say to serve the pastor or serve the leaders or serve an organization. It says serve the Lord. Serve him. The Bible teaches us that if we will witness on behalf of the Lord, if we will feed the hungry, if we will clothe those who have no clothing, if we will do the work of the Lord, whatever it might be, that we are serving God through those acts, and through those deeds, serving God. In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew 25. He said, inasmuch as you have done it unto the, one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Inasmuch as you fed the hungry, you fed me. Inasmuch as you gave a 
coat or a pair of shoes or a suit to somebody who needed it. It's just like you gave it to me. It's just like you served me by doing that. I'm not sure we truly understand the statement Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 25. Because there are times that we serve out of obligation. I'm just obligated. I've got to be there. I'm supposed to be there. It's just an obligation I have to fulfill. And so I will go and serve. But if you're simply serving out of obligation, then you're missing out what the writer said. You're not serving with gladness. He didn't say serve out of obligation. He said serve out of gladness. I'm glad I get to serve. I'm glad I get to do this. Listen, if all your job is that day, whatever it is, serving God is taking out the trash and putting it in the garbage can outside, you just do it with gladness. You're the happiest trash taker outer anybody's ever seen. Why? I'm serving God with gladness. If your job is to run the vacuum cleaner, Chris, <laughs> You and I talked about this over the week here. If you're vacuuming, then this vacuum of gladness, making the prettiest lines, go in the same direction, make it look right, but serve God with gladness. If you're on the greeter team, greet with gladness. If you're an usher, usher with gladness. If you're a singer, sing with gladness. If you're running projection or sound, do it with gladness. Whatever you do, do it with gladness. Amen. Not out of obligation. We don't serve him out of obligation. We come and some serve out of a sense of fear. If I'm not there, somebody's going to yell at me, somebody's going to fuss at me, somebody's going to be mad at me, somebody won't talk to me. We don't serve out of fear. No, I serve out of gladness. I serve out of gladness. I'm glad to be here today. I'm serving out of gladness. We don't serve out of, out of guilt. No, I'm serving out of gladness. The psalmist says, and whatever you do, serve the Lord with gladness. And whatever you do, listen, there will be some situations where you're serving in a capacity, doing something for the church or doing something, some kind of outreach. If you're not glad and there's no joy in that for you, then you don't need to be doing that. Because the people of God ought to be joyful people, and they ought to be happy people, and they ought to be servants of the Most High God. And you should have a smile on your face and a spring in your step saying, I get to do this because I'm serving the Lord, and I'm serving him with gladness today. And so the psalmist says, first, I want you to come to the house of God, and I want you to shout because of what God's done for you. And then he says, I want you to serve him. And thirdly, he says, I want you to sing. I want you to sing. The second half of verse 2 says, come before him with joyful songs. Joyful songs. And then the psalmist writes in Psalm 98, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I want you to shout, and I want you to serve, and now I want you to sing. Notice in these first three commands, shouting and serving and singing, God is basically telling us, I want you to be happy. I want you to be happy. Wouldn't it be great to have some more happy Christians around? I know enough miserable Christians and sad Christians and discouraged Christians, but wouldn't it be great to have some happy Christians around every now and then? And that's what the writer says. When you come to the house of God, I want you to shout for what God has done. I want you to serve the Lord, and I want you to sing. I want you to be happy. If you would take just a moment don't say anything. Just take a moment and look at the person beside of you to your right or your left just for a moment. And I want you to answer the question as you look at them. Go ahead and look at them. Do they look happy? Do they look happy? You see any joy on their face? Do they look glad to be in the house of God this morning? See, the more I'm talking about this, the happier you're getting. 
and the more joyful you're becoming and the more glad you are to be here, the more we talk about this. See, if all we talk about is the bad and the negative and the wrong and all those deep, dark things, and we never focus on the goodness of God, we'll all be down in the dumps and the scurs and pulling everybody down here with us. But when I shout to the Lord and I serve him with gladness and when I sing joyful songs, it almost becomes contagious, doesn't it? It just rolls out of me and rolls on to somebody else. Listen, if you have had your sins forgiven, then you have something to smile about. And you should be singing, and you should be joyful, and you should be glad, and you should be shouting this morning. So the psalmist says, come before him and serve him and sing his praises with joy in your heart. With joy in your heart. I have to confess, there have been times in my life in church when I haven't done those things. I haven't shouted to the Lord. I haven't served him for the right reasons. I didn't sing joyful songs. I will admit that. But that's where the mercies and the grace of God comes in and covers me. And even though I didn't do it like I should have, God still loved me, and he's still trying to help me get to where he wants me to be in my life. And then in this fourth command, he says, I want you to submit so I'm going to shout, I'm going to serve, I'm going to sing. Now I'm going to submit. That is what the psalmist meant when he writes in verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Four times in that verse, he uses the word His. And one time, he is God. We are his. God took every bone in your body. He took every joint that's in your body. And he welded them together somehow. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Somehow God took everything you are, welded you together. He put muscle over those bones and those joints and then he covered you with skin. God gave you eyes that see. He gave you ears that hear. He gave you a brain that thinks for the most part. <laughs> and he gave you fingers that point and can pick things up. God made you inside and out. Amen. And catch this. He made you the way he wanted you to be. He made you that way. It is a mystery to me. I don't know why, but for some reason, God decided that he wanted a slightly overweight man that was not too good looking, not too outstanding in anything in particular, that would keep on serving him and plodding along. And so he made me. And someplace along the way, he made you. Just the way he wanted you to be. He formed you and he made you. But here's some good news. God isn't finished making you yet. He's still making you. After he created you and put you together, and formed you in your mother's womb, the Bible says, and knew us before anybody else knew us. And we come forth in life, and we who have accepted Christ as our Savior are made into a new creation. Yes. So God has now made us twice, right? He formed us as humans, and the believers, he's recreated us again and formed us into a new creation. Amen. And yet he's still making us into something. The little kid song we used to sing when I was a child, he's still working on me, right? He's still working on me. To do what? Make me what I ought to be. And even though God made the sun and the moon and the earth and Jupiter and Mars in just a few days, how loving and patient he is with me because he's still working on me. It's important to realize this. 
because God is not finished with, uh, satisfied with the unfinished product. God is not satisfied with your temper the way it is right now. It doesn't mean you're not saved, but God's not satisfied with that temper. God is not satisfied every time you have road rage driving down the road. He's not satisfied with that. And so he's still working on that part of you. God is not satisfied with that weak area of your life that you keep sliding back into that temptation, that problem, whatever it is, that always seems to get you. God's not satisfied with that. So he's still trying to make you into what he wants you to be. Doesn't mean you're not saved. Doesn't mean you're not a Christian. He's just not satisfied with you yet where you are. In fact, the word of God tells us that God is still going to be working on us and changing us and making us and developing us until the day that Jesus Christ comes back again. He's still going to be working on us, still making us. Can I just tell you, you're never going to be perfect. You're never going to have it all together. It's not going to be that way. But thank God he's not satisfied and he's still working on us. So the writer says, God is your maker. You are created in his image. So what should I do? I should give thanks to God for who I am. God, I thank you for who I am. Why? Because I'm made in your image. I'm made in the image of God. I'm not perfect, but I'm made in his image. And then he says, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Here's where the problem comes in for a lot of folks. They'd rather be the shepherd than the sheep. But we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. It's not my pasture. It's his pasture. I'm not his shepherd. He's my shepherd. In fact, he's the great shepherd. And so the problem is when we want to be the shepherd and not be the sheep, But what happens when I try to be the shepherd is, I don't know where the still waters are. And I don't know where the green pastures are. And so since I'm not the shepherd, but I assume the role of being the shepherd, I get off course because I think for my life, I know where the still water is. If I could just get that job, there might be some still water and green pasture there. If I could just have that husband or that wife, if my kids were like that, if I could live in that house, if I could be in that state, if I could go to that school. And so I go searching for the green pastures and the still waters because I'm not a shepherd. And what happens is I get off course. And I never find the green pastures, Jason, or the still waters because I'm searching everywhere else but where they are because I don't know what the great shepherd knows and I don't know where I should be like he knows where I should be and which direction I ought to be going in. And so sadly, we sometimes drift off away from God and find ourselves far away from him. Listen, we have got to realize that we are his people and we are the sheep of his pasture and I go wherever the great shepherd leads me in my life to go. So God says to us today, you be the sheep and let me be the shepherd. You be the sheep and let me be the shepherd. And I'll take you to the still waters and the green pastures. Just let me lead. And so I have a command to shout and I have a command to serve and a command to sing. And then I have a command to submit to the great shepherd. And finally, I have a command to show. The psalmist says to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. In the Old Testament, the temple symbolized the presence of God. When people came to the temple, they entered through the courtyards. And they, as they got into those courtyards, those outer courtyards of the temple, they knew that they were coming near the presence of God. And yet the temple, as they knew it, no longer exists today. But we call this room and rooms like this in church buildings, we call them a sanctuary. I know we use another word, more modern. We may call it a worship center or a worship room or something like that. But traditionally, we call it a sanctuary. And that word sanctuary simply indicates that God is here. 
But the reality is God is everywhere. And I think most of us here today in this room would acknowledge that. God is everywhere. He is with you as you drive home today. He will be with you at work tomorrow. He is with you as you care for your children. God is with you every moment of your life, everywhere you go and everything you do. God is there. And that is the source of our thanksgiving. God is always there, no matter what happens. The psalmist said in one time, if I ascend into the mountains, you are there. If I go to the deepest, darkest part of the earth, you are there. There is nowhere, God, I can escape you and get away from you. Your presence is everywhere. You feel everywhere because you are God. And yet something about this bothers me. I wonder if God would begin to treat us like we so often treat him. I wonder what it would be like if God would begin to meet our needs to the same extent that we give him our life to serve him. What if you never saw another flower bloom? Because every time it rained, you grumbled, and God said, you know what? No more flowers in your life. What if God stopped loving and caring for us because we stopped loving and caring for others? Or what if God took away his message because we refused to listen to his messengers? Or what if God stopped blessing us today because we did not thank him yesterday for his blessings? Or what if God answered our prayers the way we answer his call for service? Or what if God stopped leading us today because we did not follow him yesterday? In the words of Psalm 103.10, I pray, God, we are so thankful that you do not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. I'm so thankful that you don't do that, God. I'm so thankful you don't treat me the way I deserve because of my sinfulness and because of my lack of following you and my lack of obedience. God, I'm so thankful that you don't treat me that way and you don't repay me because of that. But Lord, your grace and your mercy is new every day. And what happened yesterday, maybe I can't go back and change it, but I can try to do better today. And I will try to do better tomorrow. And I will try to do better next week. And by the help and the grace and the mercy of God, it's not just I'm going to try. I am going to do better and be better and live better and do what the Lord wants me to do in my life. So it is my prayer this morning that you will have a meaningful Thanksgiving with your family and friends, however and wherever you celebrate. And perhaps before you sit down to your meal on Thursday, maybe you will read Psalm 100 again to your family and to your friends. And if you will heed the words to shout and to sing and to serve and to submit and to show, I have no doubt that your heart will begin to overflow with thanksgiving to God for all that he has done in your life. In your handout this morning, you have a line just like we had on Wednesday night. We won't create a word cloud with this. But I just want you to take a moment, if you would, today and write down that one thing that you're thankful for. Just one thing. There's so many things that flood our mind and go through our minds that we can be thankful for. But what is the one thing you're thankful for this morning? What is that one thing God has blessed you, that one area God has blessed you, that one area God has helped you? Whatever it is, I am thankful for this today, God. 